Well, it's time for us. It's on. Yeah, it's time for us to begin this evening. Um, surprise. <laughs> um, Robert called me a couple hours ago. He's uh, he's uh, having some fever this evening, so he decided probably best to stay in. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, told him I'd do my best on short notice. So. Uh, as usual, help. <laughs> All comments are appreciated as we go through the lesson. Uh, we're on the first lesson of the new book on the divided kingdom, so I think we're ready for the questions. So there's still a good bit of material to go through in that lesson. So we'll get into that here in just just a minute. Let's begin w- with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful to Thee for this beautiful day that You've given us, and Father, for the opportunity we have to come at the end of the day now to worship thee and to study your word and we pray father that we'll learn much good from the things that we study tonight and learn from the lessons of the old testament as we study the the kings uh from the in the divided kingdom father forgive us when we do wrong we pray in jesus name amen so looking back we were pretty close to being ready to go back and go through the questions uh i had marked the section in the middle on page five uh, that was uh, it says to read first Kings 4 9 uh, 16 and then 15 26 and uh, one thing I know Robert mentioned he, he had planned on talking about because they uh, the author puts that uh, puts first Kings 14 in here but then he doesn't talk about it so he had planned to go through that story and let me get to it. First Kings 14. Uh, it's the first, uh, for some reason they say verse 9 and 16 here. It's really a whole story there. But um, the son of Jeroboam became sick. And Jeroboam told his wife to go and told, told her to disguise herself, that she wouldn't be recognized as his wife. Told her to go to Shiloh. And uh, uh, he, uh, I have trouble saying this name. Ahijah, uh, the prophet, is there who t- says, "Who told me I would be king over this people?" So he told her to take some offerings to him, and to to go and again to disguise herself, and go and um, see what would happen with the child. So um, the the Lord said to to Ahijah said. He, he, he told told him that this was uh, this was going to be the wife of Jeroboam that was about to come and ask you about the son, uh, and he told him what to tell tell her, and he also told told her told him that she would be pretending to be another woman, so he uh, so he heard her come to the door, and uh, says that his eyes were really bad, were glazed over in his old age, so he wasn't able to see, but. But he heard her come in, and um, and he asked her. He said, "Why do you pretend to be another person?" It doesn't say if she really a- answered that, but um, but he tells her, "I've got bad news." He says, "Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you ruler over my people Israel, and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, and yet not have been, yet you have not been as my servant." David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all my heart to do only what was right in my eyes Uh, but you've done more evil than all those who are before you for you've gone and made for yourself uh, other gods and molded images to to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back therefore behold I will bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam I'll cut off uh, from Jeroboam every male in Israel bond and free I'll take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as one takes away uh, refuse until it's gone and he goes on and he pronounces judgment. He says, The dogs will eat whoever uh, belongs to Jeroboam and dies in the city, and the birds of the air would eat whoever dies in the field. And says, The Lord has spoken. And he goes on to tell her that when uh, that the child's going to die. He says, When your feet enter the city, the child's going to die. And that'll be the only one that's mourned um, and will be properly buried. Uh, it's the only one of Jeroboam that will come to the grave because in him there's found something good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. And he goes on, he says, Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. And this is the, this is the day. Um, 
And it goes on, and it, and it does say that when she, uh, she departed, and when she got to the threshold of the house, that the child died, and just as the Lord had told her, told, uh, her through, the, uh, through uh, Hijah, uh, that they buried him and they all mourned for him, according to the word of, of Ahijah the prophet. And so that leads up, that's, that's the story there. For some reason, it's not really talked about in the book, but um, what we see there. What's that? What child is he talking about? It's the child, um, the name is given, it's Abijah, the son of Jeroboam. It's in verse 1. It says, at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. So this was a, I don't know if it tells, I don't think it tells us how old, but apparently it was a pretty young child uh, that was that was sick. But this sort of seems to have been the sort of the last straw. This was sort of ushering in the transition away from, from Jeroboam. As a matter of fact, the next paragraph in chapter 14 uh, talks about how Jeroboam dies and Nadab, his son, reigns in his place. Now, Honestly, I was left a little a little confused by that because it sounds like all of the male um, heirs would have would have died during that uh, during what was described to her uh, to, to Jeroboam's wife. But then it says that Nadab, his son, became king in his place. So I don't know if that judgment was immediate or if Nadab was spared, or I, I'm not 100% sure, because it almost sounded like there would be no, no males left in the house of, ne of uh, Jeroboam to take over. But then it says that there was, and it, there's a chart in the lesson that, ta that shows how long um, the kings reigned. It's over on page nine. And um, it also shows when the dynasties changed, because they changed quite a bit in the kings of Israel. It didn't necessarily pass family. From through in one family, and Nadab is the last of Jeroboam's dynasty, and he only reigned for two years. So it may be that that um, was not immediate. Again, there was just a couple of things I, I wasn't sure I understood exactly how that pieced together. Um, but it does say that Nadab went and reigned in his place. But again, I know Robert said he wanted to cover that, but for some reason the, the book does not talk about it, even though it references the, the verses. Um, <clears throat> dropping down uh, into that on page five. Oh, one thing Robert told me, he said, I'm going to be watching. So if I, and I told him, I said, by all means, text in. So I got, just got a text. He says, look at verse, um, verse 13. Abijah was old enough to please God. So we look at verse 13. It says, because in him some, there's found something good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. So Robert made the point that, that this child was old enough to be pleasing to God. So, um, so perhaps he wasn't a really tiny child then. Uh, I still don't, it, I don't think it gives us a sense of exactly how old, unless it's found in another, another chapter. Yeah, I told Robert, by all means, text, text in. I've got the iPad here. I'll be able to see when he texts. It'll just be probably 30, minute, 30 seconds behind is only, the only thing, but that's just the nature of, uh, that's just the, nature of the live stream and, um, and being live here. So it goes on, and it talks about uh, the fact that there were 19 kings of Israel, starting with Jeroboam, going all the way to Hosea. Hosea. Um, it says the inspired record will say of each of the, say of each of them he continued in the sins of Jeroboam. So, in the words of this author, at least Jeroboam sort of blazed the trail for two hundred years of of uh, disobedience to God. Now, there is one break in there that I question. We'll probably get to it a little bit later. As far as the history of the kings of I 
And never mind, I just answered my own question. My confusion was over Josiah, and I was thinking he was the king of Israel. He's not a king of Israel, he's the king of Judah. So I was thinking there was one, because we always say there's, that all the kings of Israel were evil, were wicked. And I was thinking, well, what about Josiah? For some reason, I had him in the kings of Israel. No, he's in the kings of Judah. So never mind, I was wrong. So I thought, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything bad said about Josiah. Okay. And one thing neat about this book, they do show some interesting photographs here and give some captions that explains, you know, shows kind of what some of these sites looked like or believed to, to have looked like. We've got one there, it's a entrance of a city gate and um, one of the high places uh, down there below it. And again, we're in an overview over on page eight. It's just, uh, there's some suggestions there for um, some things that would be beneficial. Um, memorize the list of kings in both kingdoms. And he, give, he provides the chart there. I don't think I've ever tried to do that where I've tried to learn the kings. <laughs> I'd have a hard time. A lot of those look the same to me. I know they're different names, but it's hard to, uh, there's a lot of J's especially, and they're just hard to differentiate but that would be a good exercise. And he talks about associating a fact with each king. I think even if we don't learn them in order, some, some of them it may be a little easier to associate a fact with than others. But, um, and he gives a few examples of that. So many of us would memorize all these kings. I'm not one of them. What's that? That you... Yeah, I've I've never even I I've never attempted it. I'm I'm sure I'm sure with enough practice I probably could. It's just that's that's not one of the lists I've ever set out to. I've never seen anybody set out to learn. Um, and he mentions when you learn if you learn the uh, kings of Judah, you're getting an additional benefit because uh, you're memorizing a portion of the genealogy of Christ since they came through Judah. So that's that's an interesting point. Uh, and the kings of Judah were all from one dynasty. They all flowed one to another. The kings of Israel, they, they had nine different dynasties. So there were breaks in their, uh, in their kings. I had never seen that laid out before like that, but that's, that makes sense. Seeing in the text here if there's anything else we want to talk about before we go to the questions um, he talks there at the bottom of chapter 9 or verse page 9 um, about how God wasn't really concerned about all the building programs or their fame or their political shrewdness that really it was one single concern and that was whether or not the king did right in the sight of God or not and that's ultimately true um, and he makes the point he says that isn't that true this is all that matters about us but that's ultimately you know the earthly accomplishments didn't really mean a whole lot um, to God it was whether or not uh, they obeyed God and, and uh, walked with God and he reiterates on page 10 that in Israel all the kings did evil in the sight of the Lord uh, there were 19 in Israel, and there were 20 in uh, Judah, all totaled. Um, of course, in Judah, some were wicked and some were, were not. And let's see. I think that's everything from the text, maybe, that wasn't covered. Any comments or questions on that? <laughs> okay. Um, this lesson's got quite a few questions in it. Um, so back on page one, number one, I had God forbidden marriage to the kind of women Solomon selected as wives. Yes. Yeah, he he made a lot of. Uh, he married a lot of, of wives just for political reasons. So they were all 
he married a lot of different a lot of different races a lot of different um, from a lot of different nationalities not just um, not just from the Jews you remember how many wives how many wives Solomon had too many <laughs> I think I heard the more precise answer on this side 700 and then he had 300 concubines so a thousand total what's that He's supposed to be what? Smart. Be really smart. He had a thousand, a thousand wives, and he was supposed to be, real, but he was supposed to have been really smart. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> I, yeah. I probably don't need to say anything more about that. That's just how, how on earth. Doesn't seem like a good idea, does it? Uh, I, I don't know that you're 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 right. He, he he knew very well in in his wisdom. He he knew that was wrong, and yet he 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 did it. And and I only did it just a little. He again a thousand. He 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 went all the way. <laughs> he went all the way. Just goes to show you how much influence a woman can have over a man. Mm-hmm. And men are warned about about that. They seem to be uniquely warned about uh, how uh, a, a woman of the wrong type can can guide you away, lead you away. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I mean, it's <laughs> we. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. And you're right. It's not just it's not just exclusive to men with women. It's women with men and all other combinations. Unfortunately, today that we have that uh, that that happens. But that's that's that is a good point. It is one of the things you sort of ponder when you read that. It, it, he uh, knowing having the the type of wisdom he had that he had been blessed with to, to know that. He shouldn't do that, but um, apparently that that apparently was his weak was his biggest weakness. Of course, if you, when you read Ecclesiastes, you see that he did he tried everything, and he had, he was uniquely able to afford to do pretty much anything he wanted to try to do. And uh, based on the inventory that he gives us in Ecclesiastes, he he pretty much pretty much tried everything. Sounds like to to find satisfaction in the temporary life. It's all vanity. It's all vanity. It's all vanity. That's right. Vanity of vanities. And he should know he tried it all. <laughs> he sampled it all, didn't he? he? He should know. He should be he's uniquely qualified to, to tell us that. So number two on page two, why was the king required to possess a copy of the law? Okay, yeah, he was to read it all the days of his life and learn to fear the Lord. Um, that's one of those little details I, had, I guess, I had not picked up on before reading through there that the king was actually required to have a his own copy uh, of the law. So, number three, how did uh, back to Solomon? How did these marriages influence Solomon? Okay, turned his heart away from God, and he actually turned it to to idols, because that's the problem with the uh, marrying from other nationalities and other countries and other uh, peoples that had uh, idol gods. And it sounds like he he spent a lot of uh, 
a lot of his wealth, once he built the temple and built his own palace, he built a lot of uh, whatever shrines or altars or, you know, he, he uh, to please these these wives, he, he built structures to, uh, in honor of and to worship these gods, these idol gods. So that's just the next progression of leading him astray was the idol gods. Uh, it says number, and I just answered number four, didn't I? In what ways did Solomon support his wives in their worship of false gods? Yeah, he built the high places for their, their gods. Uh, number five, consider the word because in verse 11. Uh, what does God say he'll do as a result of Solomon's sin? That's, verse, that's chapter 11. Okay, he'd tear the kingdom from his son. So, number six, what would be left for Solomon's dynasty? Just one tribe, Judah. And why was that? Why did, he, why did God not take everything... Because of David, yeah, it was because of yeah. Mm -hmm. And even after his death, God still showed favor to David, and so that was because of that he didn't tear the whole kingdom away uh, from Solomon's uh, dynasty, as as he puts it. So over on the facing page, on page three, after Solomon died, uh, where did Rehoboam go to be crowned king? Shechem, okay. Um, and Shechem, Shechem becomes the capital of Israel. Um, I got a text from Robert here. It says, uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17, 7, 17, 17 through 18, the king was, was to write a copycat of the law, not just have a copy. Okay, let's see. May have missed a little detail. I'm going to flip over there. It's, uh, Deuteronomy 17, 17. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, he wasn't only to possess a copy; he was to actually write a cop for himself a copy. I kind of skip. I kind of skimmed over that point. It says over in Deuteronomy seventeen eighteen, it says when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may le learn to fear the Lord and be careful to observe all the words of this law and the statutes. Um, so it was not that he was just to possess a copy and be given a copy. Hey, here's the, the fancy king's copy. No, he was supposed to actually write it himself. So that, I had totally kind of m skipped over that. So thanks, Robert. I had totally missed that that little nuance of the of, of that. You should read it daily. One thing about it, most people learn better, learn things better as they write them. <laughs> so, you know, I would think that exercise would have been helpful to, you know, just remembering the, the laborious nature of writing, of having to write that by hand. So that, that's a good point. I, had, I guess I read that and thought, oh, that says he gets a copy. Yeah, he gets a copy, but he has to make, he has to make a copy himself. That's right. Point was made that the scribes uh, transcribed the books over and over and over, so they they would learn. They would definitely. They typically knew the scriptures better than anyone, just because they had copied it so many, so many times. 
The only downside to that is I would think you wouldn't want one to get too confident because then they start writing without looking. <laughs> and then that's where, you, you know, you introduce the human element, then you start getting human error into it. So I wouldn't want one too confident when they're actually making the books. But, but no, that's true. The, that repetition, uh, we learn by repetition, whether it's reading or writing. And I think most people, I know I always did better if I actually wrote uh, I've never attempted to sit and write. I've heard of people not only just reading the Bible in a set amount of time, but actually sitting down and transcribing every word for word. It's just a, um, that would just be a huge undertaking. But it's, people have done it. People do it. It's, uh, it's doable. That's true. I hadn't thought about it, but that's, that's right. The uh, point was made that exposure to reading and writing and learning to read and write, you know, some in the earlier times when there weren't good established schools were, you know, a lot of times that people would learn to read and write from uh, the Bible and study of it. So I hadn't thought about that. It's a good point. That's right, Timothy learned from his mother and grandmother. And that's the typical way that most people, the vast majority of people learn a lot of what they learn, especially early in life from their parents. Uh, let's see, did we get, oh yeah, we got to the next page. So number two on page three, uh, what did Jeroboam say to Rehoboam? Okay. He asked him to lighten the, burden, bur the burdensome service of your father. Because uh, you remember they had been warned that when they got a king, they would be heavily taxed in various ways. And it was true, came true. And... Uh, of course, Jeroboam was called back. He had fled from Solomon. He came back after he found out that Solomon was dead and Rehoboam was about to take the, the throne. Uh, so who did, to whom did Rehoboam go for advice? For the old and the young elders. What's that? The, the old and the young elders. The old and the young elders. The old, the old first. Right. Yeah, that's what I put. He went to the elders first and then to the young men is how... Um, I don't know which ver New King James I think put it and bad idea to yeah I I agree with you I, I I don't know if it hurts necessarily to get it. I think as long as you're looking for sources that you know can give good advice, you gotta be wise enough to know that maybe your 22 year old friends are probably not the best ones to get that kind of advice from. You know, theoretically getting on, on a lot of things, getting opinions from different people can be helpful. But in this case, they were going to, these were experienced King's advisors. These were the ones that had advised his father and, but it is sort of funny that he went there first. He got the good, wise, older, wise um, point of view and recommendation, and then he goes to the the young guys. And they, and of course, you're, it's not in the questions here, but of course, the elders told him to kind of back off and uh, and you know concede uh, to Jeroboam, and the the younger said just ratchet it up, just you know how dare. Mm -hmm. And more able, it seems to me like, to give better advice than a 20-year-old. Oh, absolutely. 
it would be a rare instance that a 20 year old would give better advice than a 50, 60, 70, 80 year old. It, it'd be a rare instance. Uh, maybe, ne maybe never an instance. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be extremely rare. I hate I hate to speak in absolutes, but it it would be extremely rare for for that. I mean, um, I mean, people in, have a propensity to make a mess of things in general, but you really do when you're really young. You really have a propensity to to do it. But um, and for but and for whatever reason, he he went with the advice of the younger. Of the younger uh, group that he talked to, so definitely a, a mistake um, to <laughs> to do that. So question four there says, how did the people respond when Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders? Mm -hmm. They said they returned to their tents, Israel. And I added one thing to that because it goes on and says that they actually stoned uh, a guy named Adoram who was actually in charge of the revenue. He must have been like the revenue commissioner or whatever. Uh, they ended up stoning him. And he would have been the one that would have collected the, collected the money, the taxes and the, these increases. So um, let's see, that's in verse 18 of chapter 12. Um, it says, all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. And that, then Rehoboam fled to, fled to Jerusalem. And that's when the rebellion of Israel started. So, yeah. Um, yeah, big mistake there, for sure. Big miscalculation. Um, on uh, Rehoboam's part. That's true, and and, it, and there could have been some element of that. There, there, maybe they, maybe they had. I, I don't. We're not really told here, but maybe they had some angle to why that was a wise thing to do. Would have been a wise thing to do. Maybe they had a. May, maybe they sold. Did a good job selling it. I don't know. It may not have. It may not have been as simple as. Uh, yeah, you should listen to Jeroboam. No, I'll ratchet it up. You know, it may not have been as simple as those blunt messages, just the way I'm standing up here saying it. it there may have been some. Um, he may have been sort of, sort of sold a bill of bill of goods, maybe on why this was, and they may have believed it. They may have actually believed that that was a good a good idea. I don't I don't I don't know. It's just the way he sliced wires and things like that. I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. But you can buy that little tool at Lowe's. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. I would never have bought it, but I sold it. Oh yeah, and and things like that, you know, with electrical work and that kind of thing, things do. Things improve over time. People, there's a never, there, there's a never-ending stream of inventions of tools and aids for different things like that. So, yeah, there are cases where a younger person might have some piece of knowledge that may work better than what the older person maybe learned. You know, maybe that hasn't kept up with it. We're, if you're talking in terms of a trade, like we're talking about electrical work, but that's knowledge, though. That's not really wisdom either because if that because <laughs> if that new tool fancy new tool costs uh, you know $100,000 and it's not going to give you a good return on that investment um, the older person is probably wise enough to know that that's not it would not be a wise decision to buy it and the, where the young guy might be out taking a you know taking a second mortgage on his house in order to buy one because it's just the neatest little thing it's going to save him you know whatever per you know per, per year but, um, but generally, go go with <laughs> go with those who have been there, who have the experience, who have the, the the knowledge, and the wisdom to to give good good counsel, good advice. 
And again, generally, nothing against the 20 year olds. There's just, just generally that's not the place to go uh, for experience. Their first taste of wisdom is to know to go to the older, <laughs> to the older ones and get, get some counsel. So the next uh, bank of questions we got is on page four. This, uh, this book's kind of in a little, this lesson's in a lot of sections because it's an overview. Uh, here we're talking about how Jeroboam basically developed a new religion. Uh, that's how the title there makes it sound. It says Jeroboam made four unauthorized departures from God's ordained worship. So number one, how was the object of worship changed? Made two golden calves. And number two, to set uh, to what locations were the places of worship changed? Okay, you put one in Bethel and one in Dan. Number three says what change was made regarding the people who served as priests? Okay. According to the law, the Levites were the only ones who were to be priests, but he had them from pretty much all over, didn't he? Uh, he had them from different tribes other than the Levites. So that was not in accordance to the law. Uh, number four, to what time was the feast changed? Uh, the annual feast of tabernacles. And he, he, give, he gives it here. He says it was authorized for the seventh month, the 15th day. You might get where. Okay, the fifteenth day of the eighth month. So he moved it out a month, basically, for whatever reason. I don't know if there was any reasoning behind that. If that was just arbitrary, um, he um, was essentially making changes to make changes. Um, and I don't know if this plays into what we were just talking about, but uh, in the middle of the page there, uh, this author says the source of the changes were his own heart, and that's per verse 33. But says he also consulted with other men, his advisors. So I wonder if he still had, obviously he had unwise advisors, whether they were older or younger, uh, didn't really matter. They were, um, they were not giving him good advice. So at the bottom of that page, there's some related passages, and these come from um, other books. The first one is Jeremiah 10:23. It says, "What does God say about man's ability to direct his own steps?" It says it's yeah. It says it's not within man to direct his own steps. How about Jeremiah 17:9? What statements made about the human heart? Who can know it? I think how he ends it. Yeah, he says, The heart's deceitful above all things, it's desperately wicked. And who can know it? Proverbs fourteen twelve. What if something makes good sense to us and it seems right, but it's not in accordance with God's word? Don't do it. Okay, don't do it. Yeah, it's it's wrong. That verse uh says there's a way that seems right to a man, but it, and I never can get the words exactly right, but it, it ends in death, I believe is how it says it. And the interesting thing about that verse, he quotes Proverbs 14, 12, but that verse is so important, that exact same verse appears in two chapters over in 16, 25 in Proverbs. That exact same verse is repeated twice. So that just, uh, I always remember that's the one that's duplicated there, and, it, and they're pretty close. Same exact wording. So you can quote either one of them. Um, but we see that a lot. There's a lot of times we rationalize that something makes sense and you know, and you know, there may even be times when things don't when when it's just based on our human wisdom, we we 
maybe the only reason we can come up with is because it's it's an it's uh, contrary to what we've been told to do, contrary to to what God wants. Uh, you see a lot of that in denominational worship and denominational practices, just things that seem to be good. And if you use your human brain only, you might kind of go along. I think, I think that's what happens with people. They get pulled into it because they, they use their own human whiz, reasoning and think, well, that's this seems good. It's doing good. People are happy with it, so it must be good. It must be right. But then they don't consider that, well, the reason it's, that all may be true, but it, the reason it's wrong is because it's in con, it's contrary to what we've been commanded to do, or the example we've been given. So we'll stop there. Um, question one on page five, I guess, will be the start for next week. Appreciate everyone's participation and helping me out, helping me get through it. I appreciate it. Hopefully Robert will feel better and be back, be back soon.
so thankful to thee that you blessed us with this opportunity to come together tonight to study your word and worship thee. We pray, Father, that we've come for no other reason but to do just that, to worship thee in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray that our study tonight has been beneficial to us, that, that your name has been praised and honored in our study and our worship. Father, we're thankful to thee for blessing us with so many blessings in this life for the things that we need from day to day, like food, shelter, and clothing, and recognizing that you often bless us well beyond just the things that we need, and you provide so much for us that, that we pray that you would continue to bless us as you see we stand in need, and help us to always be good stewards of the things that you've given us so that we can bless others uh, with, with the blessings that you've blessed us with. But most of all, Father, we are thankful to thee for Jesus, your Son, our Savior, who came to this earth and lived as a man and then went to the cross uh, after living a perfect life as an example for us, for going to the cross and giving his life there so that we might have the hope of eternal life when this life is over and for your confirming to us that his sacrifice would stand for our sins and raising him up on the third day, Father. We're so thankful to thee for this the assurance that you've given us and we pray, Father, that you'd help us to spread that gospel to others uh, as we live here on this earth. Father, we are mindful of those of our number that are sick at this time. Father, we pray for them, pray that you would be with them as they recover, be with those ministering to them, pray that they would be uh, given a measure of their health back as soon as possible, be your will. And likewise, Father, for those that are grieving, we pray your comfort on them. Father, we pray that you forgive us when we do wrong. We realize we often sin and fall short of your glory. We often leave undone things that should be done, Father. We pray that you would just help us to put away these things, the things that hinder us and go toward the things that would make us better Christians in your sight. Father, be with us as we continue into this short worship service tonight. Help us to, again, to clear our minds and focus on thee as we worship intently on thee. Father, at the end of life's way, we pray that we would have been faithful such that by your grace and mercy that you give us that promised home in heaven with thee. We pray all these and all these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. 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 22. <coughs> all the way my Savior leads me, whatever I do as he
Good evening to everyone. Good to see each of you here this evening. This is going to be a short invitation. I'd like for each adult here this evening to ask yourself this question. And it, it is an important question. Ask yourself, am I saved? Am I saved? And you can answer this question and know this question by these next four questions that I'll ask each of us to ask ourselves. This next question, do I believe in God? Do I believe in God? Now the answer to all of these questions has to be yes so that I can know that I am saved. Yes, I believe in God. This next question, do I believe Jesus is God's son? Do I believe Jesus is God's son? Yes, the answer has to be yes. This third question, am I sorry for my sins? Am I sorry for my sins? The answer has to be yes. Yes, I am sorry. I am sorry that I've sinned against God. And the fourth question, Have I been baptized for the remission of my sins? And to answer this question, am I saved? The answer to that question has to be yes. Yes, I have been baptized for the remission of my sins. In the second chapter of Acts, just after the apostles had been baptized by the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in different languages, languages that they had never studied. And Peter and the rest of the apostles went out into the courtyard there and began to preach the gospel to the people. And at one point, the people... It says the people were pricked in their hearts. In other words, they were convicted of their sins. They were convinced of their sins. And some of them had even taken part in the crucifixion of our Lord. And those that were convicted of their sins asked Peter and the other apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were asking what, what they needed to do to be saved. And Peter told all, all of those that were convicted of their sins to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture goes on to tell us a little, a few verses later that that day about 3,000 were added to the apostles. 
about 3,000 were baptized for the remission of their sins. Now, if there's anyone here that didn't answer yes to all these questions, that can be changed even tonight. I know because if it's you're here that you believe in God or you wouldn't be here. You believe that Jesus is God's son or you wouldn't be here. Are you sorry for your sins? I hope so. But the last question there, have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? Now, if you, if you answer no to that question, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, to, but I have to tell you that you're not saved. We are not saved until we contact that forgiving blood of Jesus that he shed on that cruel cross of Calvary. You know, it says that when Jesus was crucified, there was two different prisoners, one on each side of him that was also crucified. And the Roman soldiers, after they had hanged there for a while, came by and to make sure that they were dead, broke their legs. But it says when they came to Jesus, instead of breaking his legs, I just took their spear and pierced it into this side. And it says that water and blood came forth from the side of Jesus. And brethren, I, I am convinced that, that when it said the water and blood came out of his side, they said that for a reason. That water denotes baptism. That blood denotes how we come into the contact with that blood through baptism. So tonight, if, if your answer is no to question four, have you been baptized? You can change that even this hour. We have water prepared in the baptistry. We have clothes for both men and women. Everything is ready. We ask, why won't you respond tonight if you need to as we sing this imitation song? The voice of the Savior says, Come across the
else has got it, it seems like, too, so be careful. Is there any other sick that we need to mention at this time? I forgot to see who's on the prayer for this. Robert, sick at home. Okay. Yeah. You come home sick today. Okay, I'm good. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity we've had to be here tonight to learn another portion of thy word. Pray, Father, it should be with those who are sick. Help in the means being used to restore them back to their much wanted hell. Pray, Father, that you go with us to our places of abode. Bring us back at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> What'd you do? I stepped in a hole. <laughs> yeah. That is. Uh, I got off the track here. Stepped in a hole more than that. Went sideways. This way. The spring. The spring. You're playing good. Thank you. Good thoughts. You probably will tomorrow. Is that is that food sufficient or do you need another? Oh, this will work. It's fine. Uh, I was going to tell you that. I